It strikes me that this year's conversation on the liberal arts is among the most practical we've ever held. Dealing as it does with the immediate experiences and struggles of people right here in our midst. But I've also been struck in these three days by how quickly very tangible problems of lived experience, how students will get through a particular test, what interactions encourage a sense of belonging, which courses or programs foster self-knowledge, how quickly these problems ascend to questions of ultimate meaning. What does it mean to live a good life? What can we expect from human communities? What are we chasing and why? Dr. Yako Hammond is someone who has a lot of experience contending with both sets of questions and also with the practices and tools that help us mediate fruitfully between them. In his 2011 book, A Playful Life, Slowing Down and Seeking Peace, Dr. Hammond contends that play teaches us the very traits we need to navigate life, such as entering into relationships, dealing with difference, and solving problems. In his most recent book, The Millennial Narrative, Sharing a Good Life with the Next Generation, he uses the biblical book of Joel to draw a line between the ordinary difficulties of life and the deepest dimensions of human experience. And in a 2017 book, Growing Down, Theology and Human Nature in a Virtual Age, Dr. Hammond argues that despite its pitfalls, technology, and especially mobile devices, can reveal us to ourselves. A vital thesis, as many of us are beginning to wonder whether our technology makes us more or less human. A practical theologian by training, Dr. Hammond currently serves as Associate Professor of Religion, Psychology, and Culture at Vanderbilt University. <clears throat> Excuse me. In addition to training pastors and therapists, he's deeply involved in work of compassion and friendship, especially as co-founder of Our Place Nashville, an organization that empowers adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities by helping them secure affordable housing, meaningful work, and supportive communities. I've known him for only three days now, but I have Yako pegged as a magnificently hopeful person. I was taken by his thesis in chapel yesterday. When the locusts show up, when struggle begins, that's when the good life starts to emerge. Thanks, Yako, for what you have already shared with us, and we welcome you again uh, to be with us this morning. Well, friends, it's good being, being with you. Um, I, I feel a little bit like an in interloper because my education, undergrad education, was in South Africa, which meant that I didn't have a liberal arts education. And then uh, I teach almost 90% of my teaching is to doctoral students. So the very students that you send uh, our way, those are the ones that, 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 that I work with. But, uh, but I hope that what I will say today will resonate deeply with you. Um, I've written a, a number of books, and if I have to give you the thread that is in all my work, it's actually about human flourishing. How do you help people thrive in life? How do you do that? Because I think at the base, that is what, uh, what all, 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 people, all people want. I was sort of surprised listening to Sarah the other day, and this is just a quote that I wrote down, help us to be human beings. That's one of the quotes that she said. She said another time, she said, I want to learn about myself. It's another quote that she said. She said, help us to understand ourselves in the world. Those are just quotes from Sarah the other, the, the other day. So I hope that what I'm going to share today is going to be uh, helpful, helpful to you. At Vanderbilt, I teach a class on play. And even though I don't uh, necessarily encourage you to teach a class on play, I do want to encourage you to take this next step home and to incorporate that into your teaching. So in the class of play, for the first five weeks, I teach students how to juggle. 
on campus, on your campus, I am convinced there are young, young students who are phenomenal jugglers. We heard from Connie that her son is professional at doing that. So I partner with the juggling club on campus, and I say, you get the first 40 minutes of every class for the first five, six weeks, and you are going to teach us how to juggle. And then they come in, and they, they help us to juggle. I'm not a good juggler. But juggling is a phenomenal metaphor to help people discover life. For one, is you always drop the ball. It, it doesn't matter who you are. You are going to drop the ball. And can you pick the ball back up without being ashamed, without feeling, oh my gosh, I'm a total failure because I dropped the ball? Uh, so that's one thing that happens. A second thing that happens is that there are always challenges. So a student would come in and say, well, I know how to juggle already. And then I say, great, here's six balls. And they drop the ball. And then we always stand in a circle. And there are students who are really good at juggling and others who are really, uh, really struggling when others are really good. One student comes to mind. He had a little bit of a neurological deficit, and the one side of his body didn't work all that well. So beforehand, I went to him and I said, you know, you really don't have to juggle. You, know, you don't have to do that. He's got one hand. He said, nope, I, I want to juggle. So he would get up, stand in the circle, throw the ball, drop the ball, pick it up, put it in his hand. Throw the ball, drop the ball, pick it up. Other students get really anxious at that point. Somebody running over, helping this person. Others running to me. How can you ask this guy to juggle? He cannot juggle. You know, angry with me. And I said, well, I, I, I invited him, and this is his choice. But juggling becomes this metaphor where you have to juggle life. And if you came to chapel yesterday, what I basically said in a nutshell is, there are six things in this story that you have to juggle constantly. And the good thing about juggling is you cannot hold on to one ball for too long, because then all the balls drop. You have to keep it in a dance of, of, of sort. So when Chris asked us, you know, liberal arts and the race to success, and we said, well, maybe that's not the, quite the metaphor that we, we, we want to use, and I think Todd said, you know, let's say uh, liberal arts and the stroll to flourishing, which I think that's, that, that, that is beautiful. Uh, I will say liberal arts and the art of juggling life. And some of what I am going to do today, uh, this image of juggling, just keep that alive and you'll see the various components coming, coming back at you. So I want to do a couple of things today. The one is, I really want to affirm liberal arts education as forming people, as shaping lives, which I think is a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, reality that, 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 that we deal with. And I think that is a strength that is more needed today than ever before. We could hear that in, in what uh, Sarah shared with us just the, uh, the, the, the other day. But I also want to sort of recognize that we we only have a student who, who walks and lives phone in hand. It's the only student you have. You have no other student. You only have a student living phone in hand. And so what does that mean for human flourishing and, 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 and living, living a, full, a full life? I'm going to ask what is flourishing, uh, but even more so I'm going to ask who can flourish. Um, Unless you have certain traits, certain dispositions, I think it's impossible to flourish. So how do we cultivate those once we've named maybe a few of those? So that's what I'm going to go into. And I'm going to identify um, a new set of intelligences for you. They are not uh, sort of uh, meant to be, um, how can I put it? They are not meant to be uh, a sort of guideposts really, uh, as much as they are core tasks that we have to engage. Uh, if, if, if Sarah said, help, help me understand the world that I'm living into, 
uh, that's a whole journey we sign up for right there. It's not something you do in a class. It's not something you do in an assignment. That is a journey that you, 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 you sign up for. And I'm going to, uh, to, to do that by drawing on uh, a book that I wrote two years ago. Don't, don't be put off by the title of theology in, um, in the title. This, this is the truth around that title, is that Baylor University Press uh, looked at my manuscript and accepted it, and it went for, uh, they have an internal peer review, and they actually said there's not enough theology in here for a school like Baylor to publish this book. And I already wrote the book. The, my, my editor that I worked with loved the book, and he said, okay, Yako, so we have to figure out something how to get it past the final review board, which was an internal review board. And I said, oh, what do we do? Because I'm not going to write this book over again. I'll just take it somewhere else. I, I'm done. And he said, why don't you add at the bottom, at the, at the, at the last section of every chapter, why don't you add uh, 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 just a piece for theologians need to reflect on your chapter if they want to think about human beings. And that's really what, what it's about. There's, there's not a ton of theology in there. And if you are not in a religious setting, I think this will be a good conversation partner to you. So I'm going to draw upon that and the things that I'm going to say uh, will, will come out of the book. Uh, Baylor gave us a flyer. You get a little bit of a discount and a little bit of a free uh, shipping should you, should you be interested. But the, the average person today, uh, if they are above the age of 40, will check in with his or her device 52 times. 52 times. Students on this campus will check in with their device at least 92 times per day. We heard Connie yesterday saying that people will wake up at night to actually do that. So how, how does that impact life when we, when, we do, when we do those things? The image in the title of my presentation of Growing Down, I get from W.E.B. Du Bois. If you've never read this essay, I can highly, highly recommend it. It's an essay he wrote in 1933. He, it was a speech he gave at the 45th uh, anniversary of his graduation. He was at Fisk University in 1885 to 1888. And he came back 45 years later and gave a speech. The field and function of the Negro College. And in this, I use it with my doctoral students all the time, and in this speech, he basically says, the problem with higher education today is that students come in and immediately they want to climb some ladder to join the elite, the wealthy, the 1% that's up there. And he says that's what colleges do. They even promise that to people sometimes, that you will become wealthy, that you will land the greatest job, that you can make all of these differences in the world. And the boy said what really should happen is that people should grow down, students should grow down, by which he meant, do you know yourself intimately? And can you place yourself in a broken world so that you can make a difference with all the, to all the people who live at the margins of society? So when other people want to climb ladders, The boy said, do you know yourself well enough? Can you read this broken world in which we live? And how can you make a difference in those settings? And from the moment I read that essay, I, I knew that he's onto something. I have a class at the moment that I'm teaching uh, on, on leadership. Millennial leadership is basically what the class is about. And I have diverse students. In, in, in my class, and some of the students have already signed up at equity firms and big law firms, and they will begin working there after the summer. And then other students in my class uh, will work in the prison industry with folk who just got paroled, and they will try to catch them and reintegrate them into society. And these are the two kinds of students that I have in my class. 
And I can honestly say they, they have a very difficult time speaking to one another. They have a very difficult time connecting. Such, such different worldviews. When I say that we only have a student who live phone in hand, uh, there's actually nothing new about that. We are extended selves, and we have been extended selves for thousands of years, by which I mean you and I engage things at such a deep level that that thing becomes a part of me and a part of you. I would guess that most of us, if you leave the home and you're about halfway down the road, recognizing you left your cell phone there, you will turn around to go and get it. And you are not going to say, well, you know, I'm only going to be away from home for 12 hours. I'll, I'll, I'll go without a, a cell phone for the next 12 hours. We, we don't do that because our cell phones have become part of, of who we are. William James, uh, um, arguably one of the biggest psychologists that the U.S. gave us, um, he already argued for some of that in, in 1890. And he, at Harvard, you can see his context of you own horses and yachts and a big bank account and a reputation. But all of that is part of the extended self. That's important for us to know because if we are part of the extended self, we cannot really say to a student in a class, uh, put your laptops away, I just want you to take notes today because what I'm asking you is literally take some of your arm away just don't use it for the and 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 Larry Rosen who was um, uh, uh, here at uh, California State he found 15 minutes for today's young folk for our students 15 minutes is the cutoff if they haven't checked in with their device they get so anxious that they probably cannot listen to your class anymore so rather than fight that, because you are not going to win that battle, uh, I would say you definitely, as you engage uh, uh, students today, you want to send them off every 15, 20 minutes on a mini assignment. We are talking today about conflict. Find me the latest conflict in the world. You've got 10 minutes. And tell me why you think your sources are credible. You've got 10 minutes. And you weave that into your class so that the, the anxiety level that students will have will be diminished and you will actually have wonderful participation. In the class that I'm teaching right now, I had students draft a covenant around technology and it was extremely conservative. It is, you can go online at any time during class, but the moment you go online, you have to come back within a few minutes and tell the class what you have learned. And if somebody sees you, we can call upon you. And that wasn't my guidelines. It was their covenant. There's something else I wanted to say, but maybe I'll come back to that. So we are extended selves. When we come to the topic of human flourishing, it gets very complicated very fast because human flourishing is extremely difficult to define. I gave you the most cryptic definition that I could find and that I use uh, on, on the screen, that it refers to sort of growth, uh, self-transcendence, maybe meaning and purpose. Uh, those would be aspects of, 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 human, of human flourishing. I think it's better for us to think of human flourishing in terms of traits. Because all the big traditions talk about human flourishing in one way or the other. Philosophers have talked about human fl flourishing for, for, for millennia too. So traits might be uh, the way for us to move forward. Um, it seems to me that human flourishing at least speaks to the following. Shalom. Shalom is this big context that we get in the Judeo-Christian tradition, which is this mixture of peace and justice it's a mixture of a very personal internal dynamic as well as a communal societal dynamic. But that would be part of, um, of, 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 of shalom, okay? Wholeness. I think that would be another part of, 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 human, of, of human flourishing. Wholeness uh, literally means for me 
what does it mean to be a person with this body? What does that mean? Uh, you know, what does it mean to have, have a body? Do I know how my engagement with technology, for instance, is impacting this body? Do I know how the anxiety that I feel in coursework and other things, or the stress that I feel, because that's really healthy, and I'll say something about that, how the stress that I feel comes home to this body. That's all part of, 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 of wholeness. But it's also tied to a relational network. We have to be held in relationships. And my guess is that the majority of students that come to you do not have those networks. They are not held in life-giving ways. And that's probably what they long for the most is, how can I be held by, by, by others? Mindfulness would be a core aspect of human flourishing too. Uh, uh, attention comes from atandra. Atandra, to be, to be stretched. That's what attention means. It's to be stretched. Can you, can you be aware uh, 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 of what's going on uh, around you. Um, Tim encouraged us um, on, 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 on uh, uh, Thursday, was it Wednesday or Thursday? That you, Thursday. To be uh, uh, beware of the imagination and to, to focus on the imaginative. I think that's all tied to, to mindfulness. Um, I think other components of human flourishing includes developing a coherent life story. I'm kind of amazed. I have a student at the moment who comes from uh, Iran and she had a phenomenal journey that took her from Iran out of a Muslim family into Christianity. That took her to Germany as a single mother of two. Finally that journey l took her through immigration services to the US and now she's a student in my building and I am so struck because she's in my class and every time that she has to tell about herself she tells exactly the same story she doesn't know that but she is absolutely stuck in her own story there's no open-endedness there's no, a little bit of something else is about to unfold, and I don't quite know exactly what that's going to be, but I know it's going to unfold. There's none of that. I uh, recently had a conversation with her and, and asked her if she can be more mindful to, that she have told our class the same story about five times already, and, and if she can assume that we heard her and take us to that next chapter in your life. What, what would that look like? What would that look like? I think human flourishing is near impossible without a sense of call and vocation. I was really struck, walked into this room. If you haven't noticed, right around the corner there on that wall, uh, the quote from Friedrich Buechner that basically says, call your deepest needs, the world hunger, that's where it meets. Um, can, can we help folk discover that cross-section between the world's needs and their own passion? And of course, if you just chase something like a great salary, well, it's probably unlikely that the cross-section is going to be there for you in, in a life-giving life way. Human flourishing is not just something we are searching for now, though. It's also something that is a little bit of a telos. There, there's an end goal. We are reaching for it. We are working towards it. We know we are not quite going to get there. Uh, but can we move in that direction at least? There's something in, in more theological language, eschatological about it. We're not quite going to arrive yet. But I think in that paradox that it's something I'm yearning for now and I'm working towards it now, while I know it's sort of elusive and it's something out there, that is a very healthy paradox to hold on to. And then we know that it's, it's, it's about happiness, but it's not happiness. We know it's about wealth and money, but it's not money. We know that it's about ability, uh, but it's, it's not about ability either. We, we know, we know those things. I'm a little bit of a visual person, so if I can give you a, an image of 
how, how would you recognize that a person is flourishing? Uh, certainly, we can look at some of the traits uh, of, of flourishing that I've just used. But I think we would recognize uh, flourishing in a person who is self-confident, who has affection for others, who has exuberance about life, who's excited about living, who has resiliency. We, we heard about that yesterday. Uh, can stick with things. Empathy and compassion, I'm going to return to that. Um, sees people as holy, or I can... Uh, use different language is even have the ability for awe and wonder. If I want to use different language, but that would be the ability to have awe and, and wonder. Loyal commitments. Can, can, can a person do that? That's a flourishing person right there. Has no need to force one's way in life. You, you know, you don't have to be a, a snowplow parent. That's forcing your way in life. Um, marshals and directs energies wisely, has purpose and meaning. I think that's how we recognize a flourishing person. So this list I actually got from the Apostle Paul in Galatians 5 in just modern language. People for millennia have thought about what human flourishing looks like. So I want to contend that not everybody can flourish, although the potential for flourishing is in everyone. But to flourish in today's world, a world driven by especially handheld technologies, we need a different set of intelligences. Now, I, I put it sort of in, in inverted brackets of new intelligences because the intelligences are actually not new at all. They are actually intelligences that most children, I think, experienced within the first three years of their life. And then it got eroded. And then it got removed by various forces that we can highlight. So it's not necessarily new. So, of course, Howard Gardner uh, first gave us multiple intelligences, and he, he kind of put intelligences for us on the map a little bit. Uh, Daniel Goleman, psychologist, journalist, came in and highlighted one emotional intelligence, and that's the big one. You know, you want emotional intelligence in the classroom and in the boardroom. doesn't matter where you go, you want emotional intelligence. And from where I stand today, I think emotional intelligence means nothing in a world of technology. And at best, it may assist you somewhat in some instances. You need a whole new range of ways of being in the world. And I think today's students get anxious to the pathological side of things, to the clinical side of things, because there's a disconnect between who they need to be in today's world and who they actually are. That's the disconnect. And because there's a disconnect, as they live phone in hand, but not recognizing that they are extended selves, that's where the anxiety is absolutely birthed. The reason why I think these new intelligences are so important is the following. Technology is neither good, nor is it bad, nor is it neutral? If technology is not good, I can categorically say technology is not going to save us. AI is not going to save us. I can tell you that. If it's not bad, I can categorically say technology is not going to ruin us. And we are not going into a hell in a hand basket because we actually do live phone in hand. I can tell you that too. But what this dictum, this quote by Malvin Kranzberg, arguably the biggest historian of technology that the U.S. ever had. He taught at the University of Georgia. When he died, his whole office got picked up and is now visible in the Smithsonian. They just picked him up and put him down in the Smithsonian. But if it is that technology is never neutral, Technology is a power relation. It shapes. It gives form. 
we had dinner the other night uh, and I have a bi-level house and all the parents were downstairs drinking a glass of wine, getting ready for dinner and I went around the corner and I yelled at my girls and the other teenagers upstairs, come on down! And one of the other parents said, oh, I never yell, I just text them, come on down. <laughs> and we had a little bit of a wonderful conversation, so here I am, raising my voice and really yelling at my kids. Do you choose that, or do you just text? Because they are, all have their phones in hands, and within seconds they were down. Because they all got the text. What do you, you know, what do you do? So uh, uh, technology is, is, is a power relation. And uh, the intelligences that I want to lift up for us, I think can help us navigate the world and life in new ways that will not make us anxious, but will lead us down flourishing paths. And I'm going to frame all of these intelligences around a set of questions. And I think if that's all you take back from what I'm going to, to, to tell you today is take these questions to your campus and ask your students these questions. Okay? Self-intelligence, the very first intelligence that I want to lift up. Self-intelligence is basically recognizing that you need a holding environment, you need people around you. You need sustainable systems around you. That's all part of a holding environment. That you're a psychosoma, which means your mind and body is connected, and you cannot just be a head. Nobody can flourish as a head. You need to be a body and a head to flourish. This self longs for security. It wants to believe in itself. Long before a child or a person wants to believe in a divine figure, for instance. Long before that, the child wants to believe in itself. Uh, in language of Eric Erickson, basic trust. That's what they long for. Part of it is that the self is always active and passive. The, the self oscillates between periods of waiting that things happen to me, passivity, and then moments where I want to be the producer, I want to be the agent, I want to be the one who is uh, doing the action, and we always oscillate between those things. The self is sexual. If self-intelligence self sets in and you recognize that the self is sexual, trust me, you will never hook up with anyone. Because recognizing what it means to be a sexual being and how do you nurture for that sexuality of yours, you will know intuitively that hooking up is not a good way to do it. And that it's actually a very confusing way to do it. And your sense of self will diminish rapidly if you engage in something like hooking up. Self-intelligence speaks to the ways how you and I constantly seek transformation. So there's this archetypal story in the Judeo-Christian tradition called the fall of humanity. This is how the story goes. A divine figure, God, came to people and said, here's a garden. You can enjoy the garden. But there happens to be this tree and you are not allowed to eat from this tree. Then the story says that uh, a snake came, came in and asked the following question, do you want to be like God? In different language, the snake said, do you want to be transformed? And the woman said, oh, I, I would love to be transformed. And she chose the wrong way to seek transformation. And the story kind of unravels after that a little bit for this young couple. So this is the dilemma that you and I were created to seek transformation. But we are not always mindful what is good transformation 
and what is bad transformation. We will just seek transformation. And most often what happens is that we do that unconsciously, of course, so we don't think carefully about the transformation we are seeking. I think today's young people, from the age of about 11, 10, 11, needs to be taught over and over again, needs to be told, you are going to seek transformation all the time. If you only find transformation in video games, it's not going to help you. If you only find transformation in risky behavior, it's not going to help you. I want to partner with you in such a way that you can figure out what is healthy transformation for you. How can I help you find that? Self-intelligence. A second set of questions that are really important. So the first one is, who am I? Who am I becoming? The second set of questions is, who are you and who are we? Every student on this campus should be able to answer that question. Who are you? Who are we? That takes us into relational structures, okay? So relational intelligence is the art of being in authentic, loving, caring, and ethical relationship with oneself, others in the divine, nature, and easygoing, balanced relationships with things. Because our relationships are not just to people. We are deeply related to our phones. The challenge about technology is that research that comes out of the University of Virginia shares that, and it's been replicated now in Canada in wonderful ways, the moment a cell phone enters a conversation, even if it's placed face down, a couple of things will happen. The first thing that will happen is that um, conversations will be short and abrupt. Almost nobody will follow up with one another. It will be a bunch of monologues. The conversation will be extremely surfacy. The very detailed, painful, difficult things we need to talk about, nobody's going to talk about that. It's going to be very superficial. Third thing that's going to happen is that conflict will be avoided at all times. So differences will never be worked through because that will put us in a place of tension if you and I differ about things. So relational intelligence is really important, but, but even, even more so around who, who, are, who are you because I'm probably engaging you through all kinds of stereotypes. And can I allow you to destroy the stereotypes that I have of you? I think uh, today's students uh, are really struggling with this because they come from maybe a, a very wealthy private high school. There's a stereotype attached to them, which is not them, but there's a stereotype attached to them. They are a first-generation student, and there's a stereotype attached to them. In the question, who are you, and who are we, um, that, that takes some wrestling to, 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 to figure out. We already heard about imagination. A third intelligence that I want to lift up is transitional intelligence. Transitional intelligence says, at this very moment, three worlds exist in this room. The one world is me my body, my subjectivity. The second world is you, your world, your subjectivity. And then something is happening between us, a third world. To be imaginative is having the capacity to enter into that third world. I mean, we do that. Liberal arts does it well because we will use language such as I was pulled in by a book. Well, what am, I, what am I saying? I didn't write the book, my subjectivity. There's the objectivity, the book. But something happened between us. And that really is what transitional intelligence is all about. If you cannot enter into that in-between space, 
which I think is the most potential filled space that you can imagine. If you cannot enter into that space, uh, you're going to be stuck because you will either just say, uh, from my own subjectivity, here is what I think you should do to better your life. And I'm just thinking that my subjectivity has any meaning to your subjectivity when it probably doesn't have any meaning to you. We cannot be spiritual. We cannot engage God or the divine without this capacity to go into that in-between world. Teachers need this capacity. Because if you cannot create that in-between space where students can enter into, they will be on their phones or laptops within 10 seconds, and they will be on Instagram and Pinterest and all over the place, TikTok, but they will not listen to you because they are not in that space. So transitional intelligence is really, really crucial. And now the dilemma, okay? One of the biggest uh, experiences that can push us into that in-between space is boredom. Technology killed boredom. Today's young people, I think, do not even know what boredom is because the moment that uncomfortable feeling of boredom arrives, so, so boredom is, of course, that sense that something needs to happen, but it's not happening. That's what boredom is. And if you drove cross country and your backseat child asked, are we yet there yet? You know, you know that time has become an issue now for that young body there in the back. So boredom is really crucial because what happens in boredom, when that uncomfortable feeling sets in of time has become a problem, what needs to happen, but it's not happening, the imagination is unleashed. Children play the best out of boredom. Children don't play when you give them the new set of toys, which they'll do for a brief few minutes and then they'll let go to go back to better things. We don't have boredom because the moment that uncomfortable feeling sets in, out comes the phone. In my town, there's a lot of four-way stops. I take sort of small roads to get to school. There is not a four-way stop where people will not take out their phone as they inch forward to be the next car who will drive off. There is no red light where people stop. Because in those milliseconds, what do I need to do now? I cannot hold the tension. Out comes the phone. So to help people gain a sense of transitional intelligence, we have to help them rediscover boredom, literally. How do we do that with our students? A fourth intelligence that I would argue is one of the most important ones is reparative intelligence. Reparative intelligence is the courage of discovering the truth of one's childhood. I had wonderful parents, but they gave me stuff. And seeking restoration for oneself and facilitating the restoration of persons and relationships and communities, nature, and I'm doing so with compassion, care, and empathy. Sarah Conrath is a researcher at the University of Michigan. She has tracked the incoming freshman class for the last 20 years. The markers for empathy in her first year students have dropped 40%. It's not rocket science, is it? 2013, word of the year, selfie. How much empathy and care how much reparative intelligence do we imagine comes from a culture that nominates selfie as word, word, word of the year? This is important for us because if empathy is on the decline, self-empathy, self-compassion is on the decline too. 
I'm new to college. I have never been to college before. Self-compassion, self-empathy would say, part of this intelligence, I am way out of my league right now. So how do I typically react when I'm very anxious? Okay, I become controlling. So I'm going to watch out. I don't want to control, which will lead me down the path of an eating disorder or something like that. But that's all part of reparative intelligence, that you know yourself at this level of engagement. Our, our, our world, of course, is in desperate need of young folk and other folk who will go out into the world and who will engage the world from the stance of reparative intelligence. A fifth intelligence is playground intelligence. Playground intelligence asks the two questions, how am I playing? How do I do that? And then also, uh, how am I being played? Because in a world of technology, that's always true. You are always being played the moment you engage technology. A different way of saying it, you are always commodified. And what does it mean to be commodified? And am I okay with that? Research that came out last year showed that about 83% of people using the internet are concerned about their safety online, 83%. But none of them give it up. <laughs> All 83% are still pretty active online. Playground intelligence is really crucial because I think for a lot of kids, play disappears almost by year three now. Um, and it's because of technology. They grow up with this highly fortified little iPad in their hands that they can drop but they can just pick it up again because it has a barrier and a bumper you know, th thick in beautiful colors and other things that they can uh, engage. Play is the most transformative experience you can engage in at will. There is no better transformative experience that I can give you. So somewhere uh, this past uh, early morning, 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock, you and I went into REM sleep. We started dreaming. Our brains were firing on 12 cylinders. Blood flowed to our brains. It was alive and kicking, even though you were sleeping deeply. And this is the amazing thing. When you engage in play behavior, your brain fires up in exactly the same way as during REM sleep. So we want to say to our students, hey, uh, finals week is coming up. I challenge you, how are you going to play 10 minutes more each day? How are you going to do that? You and I grew up in a different system. Our system said, you can go out and play once you've done your homework, which is a horrible system. Because basically, we want to say, go out and play, and now that your brain is really alive, come back and engage the work that you would like to accomplish. So you definitely want to be very mindful about those things. The last intelligence is technological intelligence. Technological intelligence is the wisdom to discern the impact of technology on oneself, as well as one's relationship to the self, others, the divine, culture, nature, while engaging and being able to evaluate digital and virtual processes, content, and objects. Because you and I live in a filter bubble or an echo chamber, there is an algorithm that has been created for every single one of us. And the main task of that algorithm is to give you what you already know and what you already like. So if we would type in here today, uh, politics, each one of us will get different landing pages because we will be steered by our algorithm to what we already know. So the question, who are you? How will I discover you if all that I'm going to get is just more of the same? what I already know. But technological intelligence is way more. It's about things such as multitasking. 
Do you know what is the ratio between unitasking and multitasking in finishing an assignment? Fourfold. If I have an assignment, I have to write a paper, a two-page reflection paper, and I'm not going to listen to music. My phone is over there. I'm not going to check any texts, no nothing. And I'm just going to work on that two-page reflection. I will probably be able to finish that reflection in, say, an hour and a half's time. Okay? The moment I begin to dabble, now I'm listening, I'm streaming Spotify or uh, Apple Music, I'm checking in every email and tweet and text that comes in, uh, my phone constantly pings and vibrates, uh, then I'm thinking, oh, well, I'm going to send quick hi to my mom in the meantime and things like that. Fourfold. That one and a half hour exercise become a six hour exercise. And then we wonder, why is our students so stressed? Because it takes them probably four times as long to finish something. Because they are so plugged in into so many spaces at so many times. Technology is really important. How do you get out of the filter bubble? How do you do unitasking? Lots of things that speaks to... Um, technological intelligence. And so, my friends, I would like to argue that today, this is your student. Your student circles self-intelligence and relational intelligence, transitional, reparative, playground intelligence, technological intelligence. And I would argue that the task of liberal arts today is to help awaken, help cultivate these intelligences in your students. If you do that, I can guarantee you they will be stretched. They may even be stressed, but they will not be anxious. One way how it will manifest for them is around time. Today's young students, my students, your students, I'm convinced will say to you too, we don't have enough time to do what we need to do. My students, because it's mostly masters and doctoral level students, they will use language such as, we do not have enough time to integrate what you want us to learn. But it's kind of like the same thing they're saying. Play is the only activity that suspends time. When you engage in play behavior, time so for a student who does not have enough time, this is the paradox. Learn how to play more. And time will never be a concern in your life. In that same essay, The Field and Function of the Negro College, Du Bois says that the university must become not simply a center of knowledge, but a center of applied knowledge and a guide of action. He says, climbing ladders doesn't go anywhere because for 6,000 years we've tried and almost every empire has fallen flat. Climbing ladders do not work, does not work. And so I want to leave you with this challenge. How can you go back to your schools and help students flourish in life. I think it is impossible to flourish if they do not cultivate, gain, receive, if they do not receive the very, very intelligences that we looked at. I look forward to the conversation that will unfold. Thank you.